This is a Y modem for the Commodore 64, and this is a Y modem 232 for just about everything else. I'm Matt D'Amico, and welcome to episode 18 of Retro Bits. In today's bit, I'll demonstrate how easy it is to connect your classic computer to the internet using one of these inexpensive Wi-Fi modems, and show some examples of what you can do once you get online. Let's start with the Y modem. The Y modem is a device that plugs into the user port of your Commodore 64 or 128. To the computer, it appears like an old school modem, but instead of a phone line, the Y modem connects to a wireless network. Where you once would dial a number from your Commodore, you now dial an IP address or a host name on the internet. The Y modem was created by Jim Drew, the proprietor of CBMStuff.com and longtime figure in the Commodore community. The core concept for the product came about due to work Jim had done on a separate IoT project. Shortly after a working prototype was completed using a separate RF module and processor, the ESP8266 came to market. It featured Wi-Fi, a TCP IP stack, and a microcontroller integrated into a single low-cost package. Using this new chip, an updated device was designed that connected directly to the Commodore user port, and the Y modem was born. To get started, you'll need a terminal emulator program. For the 64, I tend to use CCGMS, as it's compact, fast, and supports just about every device out there. The Y modem responds to conventional Hayes AT commands and gives you plenty of options to get connected to Wi-Fi, including WPS, direct SSID entry, or by scanning for available networks, as is demonstrated here. You can also specify a static IP address or use DHCP. Once you're connected to a wireless network, you're ready to explore the marvels of the internet. The most common use case is calling a BBS. In bygone times, the ATDT command would direct a modem to dial a phone number using touchtone. With the Y modem, it instead opens a TCP IP connection to the specified address and port. If remembering addresses and ports isn't your cup of tea, the Y modem features a built-in phone book that will store up to 10 of your favorites in non-volatile memory and allow you to call them using the ATDS command. When using classic telecommunications programs, you may be required to specify an actual phone number. For this reason, a spoof list has been implemented that translates the number to an address when dialing. A unique feature of the device is that it has 3 megabytes of onboard storage, which is made available to the Commodore as a virtual hard drive. A small wedge program has been implemented that lets you load and save files from BASIC, but I wasn't able to get it working in time for this video. You can also list and delete files from the virtual drive using AT commands as demonstrated here. Hopefully, my issue will be fixed in a future update, and Jim has plans to release software that improves the virtual drive's performance. In addition to the virtual hard drive feature, Jim is developing a new program called YCopy that will enable the user to create disk images from physical floppies as well as write images to disk, using the Y modem to fetch and store data from a remote server or website. A convenient inclusion is that the device has a helpful built-in reference that provides a summary of all of the available AT commands and what they're used for, useful for when you don't have the manual handy. A feature that sets the Y modem apart is that it was designed to behave exactly like a real Hayes modem. This allows them to be used to run a bulletin board using period correct software, and a number of well known Telnet BBSs use Y modems because of this. A full complement of AT commands and S registers can be used to configure the device according to the requirements of your particular software. It also has settings to configure which TCP port it will listen on and can even store a custom busy message. In this example, I'm establishing a connection to the Y modem from a PC. Just like a real Hayes modem would, it tells the BBS there's an incoming phone call. Upon answering, the connection is established. If a second connection comes in while the first is still active, the Y modem transmits the busy message and hangs up. The last feature I'll demonstrate is the auto update. When a newer version of firmware is available, the Y modem lets you know with a message at startup. A single AT command instructs the device to download and apply the new software directly from the internet. So that covers the basics of the device itself, but what can you use it for? 
As I mentioned earlier, a common use case for an internet-connected retrocomputer is connecting to Telnet bulletin board systems. Just like in the 80s and early 90s, BBSs can be found running on every type of system imaginable and provide community for like-minded retro enthusiasts. Just as in their heyday, these boards offer news, email, live chat, message areas, file downloads, online games, and more. Sure, you could access these boards from a modern PC, but there's a certain charm to doing so on period-correct hardware. Perhaps it's just the nostalgia speaking, but that's why we're here in the first place, isn't it? Anyone fancy a game of Legend of the Red Dragon, Baron Realms Elite, or perhaps Trade Wars 2002? Way back in episode 4, I talked about the old Net BBS and demonstrated how it could be used to search and download the latest software and disk images directly to your Commodore from internet sites such as CSDB. If you're not a fan of constantly swapping media with a modern PC, this is a great method of checking out the latest games, utilities, demos, and more. Another thing you can do with your Y modem is use the Virtual 1541 service. This suite of programs allows you to save your files and disk images in the cloud and access them from a website as well as mount them directly on your Commodore as device 2. It also features a chat client, a handful of multi-user games, and a number of other BBS-like features implemented through a menu-driven interface. The Y modem features a well-known user port hack, commonly referred to as UP9600, that allows the C64 to access most services at 9600 baud. That said, Virtual 1541 can use a port speed of 38.4K with a special driver that uses screen blanking while it loads. While we're on the subject, the user port 9600 hack is known to conflict with Commodore 128 burst mode drives. It can be disabled if you plan to use a 1571 or 1581 while in 128 mode, but be advised that you'll be limited to 2400 baud while doing so. Connect to the Quantum Link network and suddenly, a diverse new interactive world of easy to use services is right at your fingertips. Quantum Link, also known as Q-Link, was the premier dial-up online service for Commodore 64s in the pre-internet world of 1985. It showcased many of the same types of features found on BBSs of the day, but on a much larger scale, competing against other big-name services such as CompuServe. In 2005, developers reverse-engineered the service and created a Q-Link-compatible clone called Quantum Link Reloaded. Using the original Q-Link disk, you can now connect to the reloaded service with your internet modem and experience what it meant to be online in the mid-80s. While there isn't presently a lot of content available in the reloaded service, it is fun to poke around and see what digital life was like before the internet. Rumors have been floating around that archives of the original Q-Link content do exist, so it may be that one day the full service will be restored in all its 80s glory. In the meantime, the Reloaded devs host a hangout every Wednesday night at 8pm Eastern in the People Connection lobby, so be sure to log in and say hi. So what became of Quantum Link, you ask? Well, in 1989, Q-Link expanded to support other platforms, was subsequently renamed to America Online, and the rest is history. You've got mail. Only on Quantum Link, Lucasfilm's Habitat. A revolutionary entertainment experience where players control their own characters. 
interacting with other players to explore an imaginary evolving world full of fantasy and the unexpected. Possibly the world's first graphical massive multiplayer online world, Lucasfilm Games, in association with Quantum Link, released Habitat in 1986. In it, you can create an avatar, customize your appearance, chat and interact with other players in real time, go on adventures in over 20,000 different virtual regions, collect items, find treasure, decorate your home, buy and sell in the simulated economy, and more. Lucasfilm's Habitat. It's a wonderful new place that's simply out of this world. Coming to life only on Quantum Link. Within the last couple of years, a team of developers started the Neo Habitat project using the original source code and database backups. Now, it's once again possible to revisit the world of Habitat using a real C64, an emulator, or from a web browser. If you've seen Season 2 of Halt and Catch Fire, you may have noticed some striking similarities with the online world they call Community in the show. Clearly the writers are paying homage to Habitat for breaking new ground and paving the way for the massive multiplayer worlds that would follow. Habitat ran until 1988, when it was downsized due to cost and rebranded as Club Karib on Quantum Link, as well as licensed separately to Fujitsu in Japan. The software also formed the basis for Lucasfilm's script creation utility for Maniac Mansion, also known as the Scum Engine, which was used in many popular adventure games across numerous platforms. All right, I think that covers the Y modem pretty well. Now let's take a quick look at the Y modem 232. Following the popularity of the Y modem, there was demand for a generic version for non-Commodore platforms, and so the Y modem 232 was created. It's essentially the same device as the Y modem, except instead of connecting directly to a Commodore user port, it will connect to any machine with an RS-232 serial port. The feature set is otherwise identical, minus the virtual hard drive. Let's take a quick peek behind the scenes. Before the COVID-19 lockdowns, I had never planned on starting a YouTube channel, and I was happy just messing about. I like having all my machines properly wired up and functional, and putting everything on casters made for easy access to the cabling in the rear, which I was fiddling with almost daily. The Y Modem 232 lives at the heart of this 4-way DB25 switch box, and is normally shared between the Commodore 128, Atari ST, Amiga 3000, and Apple IIgs. All of the machines save the Commodore come as standard with an RS-232 port, so getting connected is just a plug-and-play affair. After that, going online with any of these machines is as easy as loading your favorite terminal emulator and clicking the knob. If the hardware is capable of it, the Y Modem 232 can operate at port speeds of up to 115,000 kbits per second. Believe it or not, of all the machines here, the Commodore 128 is the fastest when using the Y Modem 232. That's because the 128 has a high-speed hardware UART in the form of a Turbo 232 card. With the power of the Y-Modem 232 combined with the Turbo 232 interface, the Commodore 128 can take full advantage of 57.6K speeds and download an entire disk image in just 65 seconds. Unlike some of the next generation machines sitting next to it, the 128 can display a full IBM ANSI character set with all 16 colors at once. Using the Y-Modem 232's Telnet translation mode, you can even connect to your home Linux server and pop on IRC, check your Gmail, or edit some code in VI. Not Emacs though, never Emacs. So there we have it, the Y-Modem and Y-Modem 232. At a starting price of 45 US dollars, these devices are a great way to get your vintage computer online or set up a BVS of your own. As of now, only a third of the firmware space is being used, so there's plenty of room for future enhancements. Ideas are welcome, so check out the official Y-Modem forum if you have one. As always, a link is in the description below. I hope you enjoyed this bit, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on RetroBits.